So, uh, morning. Uh, hopefully, all of you got the emails yesterday on uh, getting on the mailing list. If you just say accept, uh, hopefully, you can. Uh, did anybody not get an email uh, for the you know link to the class website and just a mailing list? No, I mean at least those of you who have signed up for the course have received it. If you are just sitting through and uh, would like to be on the mailing list, please let me know. Drop me an email and I'll put you on that list as well. So yeah, okay. Uh, and the first assignment has been uh, posted and it's due in two weeks from now. And uh, uh, just have repeated some of the directions I had mentioned earlier, but uh, uh, there is one qualitative question and a few uh, problems out of the book. Uh, uh, also to kind of partially ensure that you read the book uh, uh, and a and, uh, few from chapter one which is the topic we are discussing right now uh, a broad overview of lasers and specifically of uh, uh, Maxwell's equations and light uh, and then uh, 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 two problems from uh, the second chapter where we make use of the fact that uh, the, the spreading of a laser beam is very very narrow it's very little and therefore you can trace the light as lines or rays uh, and uh, this part of it uh, will be covered in the subsequent classes after today. Uh, we'll just maybe get started on it today and then uh, uh, Friday and uh, next week we'll talk about the ray tracing approach. Why do we need ray tracing? Essentially to design the cavity for the laser you know, because as you know if you, your light must bounce back and forth between uh, inside the cavity and not escape the cavity. and. Uh, uh, so if you uh, we'll see that very soon, you'll realize there are some stability criteria. If you don't design the cavity properly, the light is going to escape, and you cannot get the gain that you desire to make the laser. So so, uh, the, and and in order to get to that point, the amount of spreading of light, the the uh, reason why we can use ray tracing, uh, and uh, uh, and some aspects of coherence. Today we are going to spend time in in, in discussing about. Uh, 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 light from Maxwell's equations perspective or from a, a classical electromagnetic theory. So, uh, so again this is chapter one and I've kind of already gotten started and this is uh, somewhat of a review but we will uh, kind of uh, uh, distill out the parts that are necessary to understand lasers. Uh, it's obviously electromagnetic theory is extremely rich uh, and uh, we already got started with uh, uh, understanding that uh, uh, there are some uh, of Maxwell's equations, the Gauss's laws are time independent and they tell you that if you have a time independent charge uh, that's not moving in space, you have electric field. Uh, so charge leads to electric field or a displacement vector if you might. And if you have a fixed current flowing in a wire, a fixed current uh, which is not changing in time, you can have a magnetic field. Uh, that actually comes from here, a, a conduction current leads to the magnetic field, that's Ampere's law. or you know, uh, before Ampere there was Biot-Savart law and I think you've probably done that in some introductory courses and such. So today we are going to look at the wave aspect of this story uh, uh, and, and uh, first we'll look at uh, waves in, in free space uh, and, uh, and then in material media. I think we know that uh, in a laser the gain region is where it, the waves or the light is interacting extremely strongly with atoms. Right? Uh, that's the gain material. It's causing stimulated emission, right? I mean, that's that's where you, your uh, photon gain comes from, and we want to kind of uh, get to that point from a classical electromagnetic theory perspective today. So. Okay, so uh, some standard things uh, we just had uh, briefly touched upon in the last class that uh, uh, you know the fact that uh, uh, light is an electromagnetic wave was realized in you know 1880s, 1890s, and so on. Uh, uh, so, uh, anybody knows was the first proof that light is an electromagnetic wave? Pr uh, experimental proof. Uh, any, yeah? So, uh, let's see. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, Faraday had a very strong hunch that it was indeed a mixture of electric and magnetic fields, but he had a hard time proving it. Uh, so he actually, let me just say, so something called a Faraday rotation where he takes uh, light uh, across in a polarized beam and he applies a very large magnetic field and it rotated the, the uh, polarization of, uh, the magnetic field rotated the polarization of light and we're going to look at the polarization aspect and all that today. So that was kind of first proof but really this experiment which we use every day today in our radios or 
telephone calls and all that where you have a oscillatory current being or voltage being pushed into the metal wire and it creates light or electromagnetic this was first done by Heinrich Hertz you know as in Hertz the uh, in a unit for frequency and and then this, this and he was able to create uh, a spark here and pick up that signal far away so you know through through vacuum and that was the first proof that light is really a uh, mixture of electromagnetic wave. So this, this is a very old experiment and we are using it uh, regularly today, right? Okay, uh, uh, so, so I'm going to go through, I, I'm not going to go through too much de uh, you know, deep into it because I hope we understand this in the, in the spirit of a review, uh, but I've s stressed earlier that in case you, some of the concepts are not clear, please stop me when I'm talking about these things right now. Okay, uh, uh, so um, uh, let's actually uh, start using some of the notation of, of, uh, of the textbook. And uh, uh, the notation used in the, in the, in the textbook is uh, uh, the following. Uh, and these are notation that we, we just use initially and we'll kind of dispose of them very soon once we go into, uh, uh, into, into a monochromatic you know, laser uh, domain where you have only one frequency so you don't need to kind of worry about uh, quite a few things. You know. So uh, this is the electric field. You know, it's, it's, it's a small e, and uh, uh, this is uh, electric field as a function of both space and time. As you know, electromagnetic fields are uh, oscillations in electric field and magnetic field that change. So things ch are oscillating both in time. So if you sit at any point in space and you track the electric field, it's going to go up and down. That's, that's clear, right? And if you, uh, 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 on the other hand, if you move along this axis, that's you're moving in space, uh, uh, at any snapshot of time, you freeze time, take a snapshot, and then it's also oscillating, right? So it's a space-time oscillation. And, uh, and then so both variables must be in there, right? And, and Maxwell's equations are written in terms of this electric field and the magnetization uh, field, uh, you know, where B is kind of, mu times h, so, so that's, that's b is the magnetic field in Tesla and h uh, uh, is magnetic field intensity, you know, it has various names, but I think, I, I think you know what it is, right? So, right? Okay, so, so electric field, uh, now if you take uh, the electric field and, and uh, Maxwell's equation, or in particular Faraday's law, what it says is if I take the electric field and I take a curl of the electric field, in pictures, uh, I think we have already uh, 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 kind of, uh, well, uh, so, so curl of the electric field will be uh, generated, there will be a finite curl of electric field only if there is a time varying magnetic field. And there is a mu here, I'm going to write mu naught, where mu naught times h is what we typically refer to as our magnetic field, you know, small b. In, in free space with no material media. Is that okay? And, and, and similarly, if I take my magnetic field and I take a curl of that, uh, uh, I, I, I'll get uh, actually two components. Uh, one of them will be a current due to conduction. If there's any material, it has maybe free electrons like a metal or a semiconductor or a plasma, whichever way you look at it, any, any ma if there's matter and there are free charges to move around, there's a conduction current because of them. And, and then there is a, 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 a displacement current, which is, uh, uh, you know, essentially it would be written as a time derivative d over dt of uh, the displacement vector. And displacement vector for now, we are just going to write it as epsilon naught times e or you know, uh, for material, yeah. where there's no material, it's a free space right now. And in a free space, this will obviously also go to zero because there's no atoms, to, uh, no electrons to move around either. So, so. so these are really the constitutive equations for, for uh, getting, uh, uh, so essentially if you, if you solve these two together, the claim is we're going to get light out of this. I mean, it's electromagnetic wave. The wave equation will come out of this, will fall out of this. Uh, the fact that speed of light is 3 times 10 to 8 and all that will fall out of the, these two equations, right? So, so uh, um, and then uh, what I want to uh, uh, now kind of simplify our life by, say, by doing the following. We write the electric field, uh, which is a function of space and time. So we kind of decompose it now into a time component and a space component. 
right? We, we, we do a, a, a separation in some sense of variables, and that space component, we write it as big E here as a function of space, and then we're going to write the time component as an oscillatory signal, oscillatory signal. And I think you can kind of see where we are going. We have talked about laser as a unique frequency. Right? It has a unique frequency, right? Because of the frequency times its wavelength is equal to C, right? Uh, with speed of light, it's, it's clamped. Therefore, it has a unique frequency. And we're going to write it as e an oscillatory signal with a certain frequency. I think you know it's you know, I omega t. Uh, unfortunately, this book uses j, but that's OK. We are going to you know, use j, uh, sorry, j and omega and t. J is the complex uh, square root of minus one, right? So, so that part. Yeah. And, so, and, and that's the uh, transform we're doing. And, and uh, that's the full, uh, uh, well, OK. So, so as you know, this can go complex. But an electric field or a magnetic field by itself is always real. Right? It's a measurable physical quantity. So uh, we take the real part. All it's saying is you are oscillating as a sine omega t or a cosine omega t. That's all, right? So, so that's, that's uh, really what it is. And, and I, I think you have probably. Uh, seen this sort of a phaser sort of picture many times. So I'm going to not spend too much time, but essentially just transform these and write it uh, not in terms of the t so the time will be absorbed because you see there's a e to the power i omega t. The curl is a derivative in space. Right? It doesn't mess with time at all. It leaves time factor as it is. So if you have time factor like that, it stays as it is, appears on the left side and also on the right side. So they just cancel, right? No more time variable left, and you end up with curl of uh, uh, electric field will be minus h over del t. And I think we, you know, just should be familiar by the time, by this time, that if we write it in this form, uh, then then uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, curl of e. If we write it in this form, oh, sorry, oh, <laughs> you should have caught me. I mean, as you know, there will be no time derivative here, right? But because we have taken a time derivative, d over dt acts on this, pulls a j omega, j omega to the front, right? And so uh, uh, this is your j, and there's omega, and then there is h, right? So that's your, right? Is that clear? So this is an algebraic form. Uh, uh, so this is still a differential form, but we have gotten rid of the time, time variable here, right? And similarly, curl of h will be equal to uh, the conduction current uh, plus uh, uh, the j times, uh, you can write it in terms of the uh, epsilon naught times e, which is, you know, the, uh, uh, okay, so, so let's actually write this down because uh, there's a physically important quantity here, d over dt of small e, and d over dt again is going to pull out a j omega to the front, right? And so you get j omega epsilon naught E, right? and, and, and this, would, this would be all if, uh, if I were in vacuum or in, in, where there's no material. If you have a material uh, media like a ruby laser where you have a sapphire and then some uh, atoms buried inside, so you have some material polarization. And we'll talk about this later. Let's not worry about it, that at this point. And this quantity here is, is what we're calling as our displacement vector. Right? So, so, you write it. So, so this is your... Uh, uh, monochromatic, you know, single frequency. If you know your frequency of the laser, the omega, which is sitting here, that is omega is 2 pi times the frequency right, of the laser, if you have a single mode. If you have two modes, you have equation for each. Right? Each of them has a separate equation. This frequency is different for each mode. So, yeah. If you have a broadband light, like a sunlight, then there are many frequencies. You know, black body radiation, there are many frequencies. So there's an equation for each frequency, you know, point in the axis, right? Does it make sense? So for example, in sunlight, uh, uh, you know, most of the, uh, so the greatest intensity in sunlight is in the green regime, and that's why most of the, uh, you know, trees and uh, living things on Earth have, you know, very strong sensitivity to green. And therefore, when you sweep your omega, and you look at the, you know, this equation, and it will tell you, you know, how much electric field and magnetic field is in sunlight, right? right. You know, when you sweep your frequency around green, when you hit green frequency, 
this will peak. The amplitude of electric field is the maximum. That's what it means, mean, meaning the intensity of green radiation is the highest, right? So that's just a physical meaning of that, right? So, okay, so uh, typically the electric field for sunlight would be about a uh, <coughs> thousand volt per meter. So if you have one meter, you know, you can drop 1,000 volts, you know, so, so that's, that's uh, not small actually if you think about it, so yeah. Uh, okay, so, so these are the two uh, uh, time independent uh, Maxwell's equations and uh, the reason uh, we are uh, kind of doing that now is because we are also going to take away the differential form now, the curls and, you know, also the divergences earlier on and make it a, make it a completely algebraic equation you know, uh, uh, where, where there are no derivatives left anymore, right? So, and just like we took what you call a Fourier component in time, we're going to take a Fourier component in space too now and make it a completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, algebraic equation. But before we do that, I just want to uh, talk about the presence of material media because if we are talking about light propagation in free space, you know, we can run with this. But we know in a laser, a material is the one that's giving us the gain. It's one of the most critical things in the laser, right? Uh, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we, we want to understand how these electromagnetic equations, how do electric and magnetic fields respond uh, or affect and in turn get affected by the presence of material media. And uh, so for this class, really what we want to know is D is epsilon naught times electric field plus a certain thing here, which is the polarization. Yeah, polarization, which uh, captures everything that the material has to offer to you. you know, it's atoms and, and it's polar, you know, how electrons get affected by light, they get you know, pushed uh, uh, around in time and in space also because of the propagation of an electromagnetic wave. All that thing, is all, that, all that information is buried inside polarization. So that's how we're going to look at it. Okay? Uh, and, and, and the picture for that is, is a, a very straightforward really. And if you have an electromagnetic wave going through, and you have any material medium, a material medium has a atoms, atom has a nucleus and electron cloud, right? Let's say I have electric field going through and the wavelength is extremely large. So in this little window of three atoms, the electric field is roughly constant, let's say. I mean, it's not changing too much. I've taken a snapshot. The things are always changing in time, right? I've taken a snapshot and in this window, the electric field is, let's say, pointing down in this, at this, in this half of the cycle. And in that so half of the cycle, the, these blue things are electron clouds. They are getting stretched, right? If you have electric field pointing in this direction, the electron cloud push gets pushed that way, right? They get stretched. And therefore, now you see each atom was electrically neutral. Uh, well, it's still electrically neutral, but there was no dipole. You know, the center of positive charge and the center of all this negative charge electron cloud were exactly at the same point. Right? The moment the electric field appears, you, get, you stretch it out and now you have formed a little microscopic dipole, right, within the atom, right? This is a classical picture. You can solve it completely with all its quantum mechanical glory. And what you'll get is, yeah, you have an electron cloud here, but the centroid of that electron cloud, you know, mod psi squared and all that is shifted a little bit. That, that's what you're going to get you know, from, when you look at the... And so you have these microscopic dipoles and you add up all these dipoles and you can see uh, from the signs of the dipole here, you have positive charge at the bottom and a negative charge on the top. And it, you know, the field due to the dipole is going against the electric field externally, right? That's, it's trying to cancel it, right? It's trying to cancel it. And uh, how, uh, if you take all these dipoles, uh, microscopic dipoles in any material media, and or you can, for this course, kind of call it a gain medium if you might. Uh, uh, so you take all these little microscopic dipoles, each of them is electron charge times some dipole length. You know, that little length between the centroid of the negative uh, and the positive charges. So that's one dipole, and you essentially take all the dipoles in a fixed volume, right? And you sum up all the dipoles that is inside a fixed volume, maybe, you know, 20 atoms or whatever. And that quantity, if you do a, what's called a mean field approximation, where you, you know, uh, average it out over a large number of atoms, that quantity is what you call as polarization. That's physically a microscopic picture of polarization. Uh, this, this, uh, this is a classical picture. It has undergone quite a bit of refinement recently using, you know, Berry phase and all this kind of other quantum refinements. But classically, it's pretty clear what it is. You know? so, so at least intuitively, it's very clear what it is. Uh, so that's polarization. And uh, 
Uh, after all is said and done, I think you see that polarization here is a response to the external electric field, right? And so uh, uh, we are going to write the, uh, uh, that response as polarization is equal to something times the external electric field. And, and, and that something is going to be uh, written in this form, and, and that's what we are writing here. I mean, all the microscopic details are going to be absorbed inside this quantity here. The way we are, we are splitting off an, a little epsilon naught here for ease of, uh, uh, you know, um, for, for, for kind of taking and putting it into this equation, an epsilon naught constant, right? And this thing here is going to be called the electrical susceptibility. How susceptible is the material ability, is the material to uh, uh, to an electric field? Uh, how susceptible are the electrons uh, uh, to be stretched, or you know, or, or, or to to respond to an external electric field? Right? So, uh, uh, so I mean, a good way to remember this is is uh, uh, well, okay. So if that's the polarization vector, then the total displacement vector here, uh, which we had written as. Uh, will be this, which is uh, the displacement of uh, free space with no matter, and then plus the amount due to polarization. So, so that's, that's how uh, this total uh, vector is going to look like. The, 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 the vector that enters Maxwell's equations, D is, uh, sorry, here D is this. Because you see, free space does something to you, but then there's another term which matter does to you. Right? And that term is completely consumed in this term. That's, that's the idea. And, and, and uh, because of this sort of a definition here, we, we will write it as this. And uh, I think this is very familiar to you probably now. You have epsilon naught 1 plus electric susceptibility times electric field. And this quantity is called the relative dielectric constant, right? Relative dielectric constant, you know, like glass or any other materials, there, semiconductors. Uh, so, so from here you can see that if you didn't have any material, uh, there's nothing to you know, polarize, so chi E is zero. Right? And therefore relative, relative dielectric constant of air or vacuum is one, and that's any atoms is going to give you some non-zero chi E now, right? And then therefore you have typically the refractive index of materials. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about refractive index. So refractive index is equal to, uh, uh, which is extremely important for this course, obviously, is uh, uh, so the n square is equal to, uh, okay, so n square. This is refractive index. n is refractive index. And uh, so the relative dielectric constant is equal to uh, the square of the refractive index. Right? So is that, yeah? yeah. And, and uh, uh, or in other words, refractive index is equal to square root of the relative dielectric constant, which is one plus the susceptibility and all that sort of thing. Right. So, so just as a very rough measure, if your relative dielectric constant of a semiconductor is nine, you know, then the refractive index is of the order of three. And then that's true for most semiconductors. It's about three. And the refractive index obviously plays a big role because it slows down the speed of light inside the material. And, and it, it determines quite a few other things, right? So this, what I wrote here, is true for our isotropic medium, meaning in, no matter which direction you go, these atoms are equally polarizable. Uh, they don't have uh, intrinsic you know, preference to you know, get stretched out this way or that way. But if they do, then that's, uh, uh, that's an anisotropic media. And in fact, you do have quite a few anisotropic uh, materials, you know, uniaxial materials, crystals that are hexagonal, Things like that. So in that case, the chemical bonding is much, you know, much more dense in one direction than in the other directions. In that case, even if your electric field is in this direction, the atom, the electron cloud will prefer to be kind of polarized more in that direction than in this direction. For example, so these have. Then what happens is we are going to see today this 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 dielectric constant, uh, or uh, yeah, this dielectric constant is dependent on which direction is the electromagnetic wave going in, you know, x or y or z. It depends on which direction. That's an anisotropic medium. I'm going to look at that. OK, so, uh, so, so with this little change, uh, uh, um, OK, let me just briefly stop. I, I, I know that when I polled in the, last, uh, in the first class, uh, some of you had said that these are hopefully, you know, if there are any questions, please stop me right now, because I'm 
going through this a little fast. Any, even simple, doesn't matter how simple questions they are. If not, okay, yeah. So, so uh, let's uh, move forward then and look at uh, uh, what is the uh, impact of, of having uh, a material uh, in, the, uh, in, in the presence of a material, how does the electric and magnetic field look for a light wave passing through a material? Right? So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to first realize that uh, uh, we're going to look at you know, these two uh, uh, time dependent, or rather, the, 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 uh, well, we, we made it time independent. We're looking for the space dependence now. But actually, let's go back to the, I'm flipping back and forth now, but uh, let's go back to the. Uh, So the way I would write it now is, is uh, this is the uh, uh, curl of, all right, let, let me write the whole thing. So I have a conduction current plus epsilon naught. Uh, let me write the full thing first. You have a displacement vector here, right? But we just saw that the displacement vector, we can write it as epsilon naught e plus a little polarization vector, right? We just saw that, right? So it's so a displacement vector, and, and hopefully you can you know, go back and forth between small h, big h, small e, because small e's are completely time dependent. I mean, there is a time variable inside it. And this polarization vector, if you look at the gain medium of a laser, uh, if you remember we were you know, discussing the gain medium of a laser where I have mirrors and maybe I have a, a material medium here uh, with some atoms. Let's say this material medium is a, is, is, is a crystal of sapphire, you know, let's say, example. Uh, and that crystal we're going to call as the lattice. Yeah. Lattice of the medium, of this material medium. And then there are inside it are some titanium atoms that are implanted, or, or, uh, and, and this, those are the atoms which we are calling upon to give us our spontane, you know, stimulated emission, right? So those atoms, I'm going to call as our active medium, or gain, you know, active region of the, uh, 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 of, of, the, of the gain medium. And this is the purpose of the lattice, is pretty much to hold the active region in place. Just not let it you know, kind of go away or something, so just hold it in place. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, the lattice medium is going to have its own atoms, is going to change the speed of light inside it, right? Change that, right? So, so typically, the active medium in, in the in the uh, gain uh, in, in the, so the gain spectrum is composed now of a lattice and an active medium, two components, right? and 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 the lattice. So the gain medium uh, 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 typically would be uh, it, sometimes it's a gas, in which case it's pretty much vacuum, and then you have some atoms inside. But if it's a solid like a sapphire or a semiconductor, for example, and the active region would be a quantum well or quantum dots inside it. You know, in that case, the, I can break up the polarization into two, two components, one due to the lattice and one due to the active medium. Both are polarizable, right? Does that make sense? So, so. so both of these, uh, you know, so because both, both of them uh, have, uh, a crystal has atoms like this, and some of them are not that of the lattice, but of the active medium, so titanium or some other things. So I have two components. And then the reason I'm doing this is because we're going to talk about a laser. You know, this part is not going to give you uh, uh, your stimulated emission, but it will definitely change the speed of light inside it, right? Because it's a material medium, it's going to change the speed of light. So we need to be you know, careful with this. And the active atoms are really uh, a small fraction, typically, of the whole lattice, a small fraction. This is some quantum dots or quantum wells or a few titanium atoms in a sapphire crystal, you know, that sort of thing, or a gas, which is very dilute, right? so helium, neon, things like that. Right? So, so as a result, I want to write this as two components now. One is due to the lattice, plus one is due to the active medium. Right. Right. So that's your Maxwell's equation that we want to kind of uh, solve for the laser. Uh, and, and, and then find out how does my electric field and magnetic field oscillate in time and space. Similarly, I'll have a curl of electric field, which is minus mu naught dh over dt, right? 
what I'm assuming here is, uh, so I've, sh I've talked about this part that the electrically polarizable, if you have a magnetic material like iron or you know, some, some, some other ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic, then you also have spins and they can get polarized too. So as a presence of a magnetic field, it can magnetize itself, right? It can align the spins. It's a ferromagnet. We are not talking about that right now. In, in this, so we are saying that my uh, magnetic susceptibility is, 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 is uh, zero for us, for example, right now. We are looking at non-magnetic materials, and, you know, and that's true for many of the uh, active, uh, many of the, quite a few of the laser materials we use, uh, and, and therefore I'm not going to add the magnetic polarization terms here, but only the electrode. So that's a simplification, but it's kind of true for most, most uh, uh, the things we are interested in. Okay. So uh, I'm going to just uh, do this once. I mean, so essentially this, this is the set of Maxwell's equations I want to solve for, for the gain medium of a laser. And then uh, 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 from here, we'll see now that, that what will emerge is, is a, uh, really a very informative uh, solution, except we won't be able to solve it right now. We'll, 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 we'll keep that as a uh, very useful tool for later. So, so we're going to see that now. Right? Uh, so, okay, so how do you solve this part? Essentially, you realize that uh, uh, if you have a gain medium and there's no free electrons to move around, every electron is tied to its active atom nucleus or the crystal lattice. It's, it's, uh, uh, there are no, no free electrons to move around in the gain media. Therefore, this is zero. There's no conduction current. No, no, I mean, if you are a metal, it will, you'll have a lot of conduction current, but we are, you know, metal is the last thing you want in the in the gain medium because all the light will get absorbed, right? I mean, that's, so that's a very hugely lossy system, right? So you don't want that, right? So it's typically an insulator, uh, uh, either vacuum or, you know, some, some air or like that. So that term is zero. And then, then we notice now that uh, we have uh, 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 the lattice polarization. Uh, actually, yeah, so the lattice polarization, you can invoke this relation now, the polarization. Uh, this is written in DC, uh, uh, sorry, this is written in time-independent form, but I think you realize you can also do it completely in the time-dependent form. And lattice polarization will be epsilon naught times the electrical susceptibility, maybe as a function of frequency, times the electric field. And that's what it's going to get there. But the atomic, you know, the active region polarization, we're going to leave it as it is. We, we don't want to, you know, kind of say what it is because later on we'll see that when we come in an electric field the dipoles the you know microscopic details of the uh, dipoles uh, that that form the energy levels that give you stimulated gain they depend a little bit on on you know isotropies and isotropies and all we don't want to make any assumptions on that right now we want to leave it as it is the, uh, the atomic polarization term but with that i think you see right away we can combine epsilon naught and the and the uh, so susceptibility of the lattice, L, and this is L, lattice. So I combine the two and I get my re relative uh, uh, dielectric constant, so I get curl of H is equal to uh, epsilon zero, one plus chi of lattice times del E over del T plus del of polarization of the active region. Okay, and and uh, 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 so so that's the uh, and I think you realize right away this is essentially your refractive index whole square right? that, that 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 you get right there from here relative direct constant squared. And, and, and so that's your curl of uh, magnetic field. This is kind of probably the uh, harder part of the math we're doing today, uh, and, and, uh, I, but it's hopefully worthwhile just because we end up with a very useful result that's going to motivate a lot of things we're going to do later now. So, so now the curl of electric field is this, and I think you realize the way you uh, uh, solve Maxwell's equations to get light out of it is you take a curl again here, curl again. But why? Because you get a you know, time derivative, doesn't mess with curl, curl can slide in here, act on this. You get a curl of H, but you know what curl of H is, right? So you can eliminate uh, uh, the magnetic field completely, right? That's how you solve Maxwell's equations so for, for getting you know, the electromagnetic radiation out. So, so I'm basically taking a curl again of this equation and you get curl of, curl of electric field is equal to minus mu naught 
times d over dt times curl of magnetic field. And that you can now plop in here. And you see you have now an equation in electric fields and a polarization of the active region. Let's write that down. And we are done then with that. Now, this is a, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, uh, you, you may remember or not, but curl of curl of any vector, curl of curl of any vector uh, is given by gradient of the divergence of that vector, you know, minus the Laplacian of that vector. It's a, you know, kind of uh, identity for any vector field. This is uh, true. And, uh, and with that, uh, uh, we realize that there are no free charges anywhere. Divergence of electric field is zero. First Maxwell's equation or Gauss law. Therefore, we, what you end up with there, I'm going to just write down the final solution now, del square of electric field minus all said and done, you know, this is how it's going to look. Del two over del t squared electric field is equal to mu naught Did I do that right? Uh, yeah, okay. So this is, again, this is uh, from your book, really. And, and uh, this, is, this is the uh, equation for, sorry, squared. Uh, equation for propagation of electromagnetic wave through any material medium, any material medium. If you don't have a material medium, refractive index N is equal to one, so you're going through vacuum, right? And there, there are no active atoms to polarize at all, so right-hand side is zero if you have no material medium. Right? And then you recover your traditional Maxwell equation that looks uh, like del square minus one over C squared. C is the speed of light, right? Del two over del T squared equal to zero. That's your traditional Maxwell equation, right? What does it say? It says that, well, here C, is one over square root of mu naught times epsilon naught, right? Which is three times 10 to by eight meters per second. But if you have the light wave propagating through any material medium, the speed is not C, but it's C over N, where N is the refractive index, right? And uh, uh, not only that, on the right-hand side, I have something very important sitting here, right? Uh, uh, and, and that is uh, what's called the source term that drives your field. This is what is going to give us gain and stimulated emission. Without this, there is no laser on the right-hand side. These are the atoms, the active atoms, or active region of the, of, of the laser that is going to give you gain. Now this is a, uh, uh, if, if the right-hand side is zero, I think you realize the solutions are very straightforward. You get uh, uh, you know, any function that looks like T minus, you know, any function that has time minus length over speed of light is going to work, right? But in three dimensions, we generally don't write length. We write, you know, r dot, you know, some uh, propagation vector. If you're going in the x direction or y direction, depends on which direction. So this is uh, uh, the way. So any function, you can write down a sine of, you know, something times t minus this. You can write down a Gaussian e to the power minus, you know, this whole thing square. You, you do whatever; it's going to work. It's going to solve this equation. You can check it. Right? So the r is sitting here, time is sitting here. The time derivative is going to act twice on this, and the space derivative is going to act twice on space. It's going to satisfy that equation. You know, as long as you have a c sitting here, it's going to work. This is the nature of that function, any function. And I think the simplest function we, we choose is e to the power i, or sorry, j, uh, uh, k, so omega t minus k dot r. That, that's the simplest solution we choose. Because it's easy to, you know, you can de take derivative as many times and all that stuff. It doesn't really mess up with anything else. Actually, was there a question? There was some confusion here. I think. No? Okay. Okay, so uh, um, uh, le let me uh, just, just ask, uh, uh, again, uh, hopefully it's making sense why we ended up here. You know, why, why did we try to derive this equation, and the re reason really is because uh, this term typically is not talked about in most uh, 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 introductory courses in electromagnetic theory because you look at 
propagation of waves through, through uh, free space. Uh, but in a laser, if you're going through free space, there is, you know, they're not in business because there's no gain. That's really why we're looking at it. Because this term, the source term, is going to give you the gain. So, and just to be clear, uh, uh, it, there's a mu naught sitting here, and this polarization part of it is, is due to the, you know, atoms that will cause stimulated emission. No, you can go uh, fully quantum on the, you know, on, on this equation and you quantize the electromagnetic field, and you will end up with quantum field theory, and these will change into uh, 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 slightly different forms. But the, uh, when you sum up all the modes, you are going to end up here again. You know? So, so there's a correspondence between the quantum and the classical. Yeah, there was uh, a question. You mentioned something about gain. Um, what yes. Uh, I see. So, uh, so gain was uh, so we. Uh, if you remember, we discussed in great detail uh, how do you amplify photons, you know? uh, and and uh, uh, so that that's really what we mean. So uh, gain is amplification of light, and and that happens as by stimulated emission. You know where where uh, the if you where where if you have an excited state, uh, electron is sitting here, and you have one photon coming in. Uh, this atom is forced or stimulated to cause a transition. The electron falls from there to there, and it emits another photon of the same phase, the same wavelength, and, and you have two photons now, and you had one photon coming in, you have two going out, so that's gain. You have gained the photon number, so that's, that's what we mean by gain. And this, this right-hand side term here is our gain term. That's, that's what we are really trying to get to. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, and, and uh, now, um, now, th so beyond that, uh, I think there are some uh, very standard things about uh, electromagnetic waves uh, that, that we can write down. Uh, for example, if I have a wave going to the right, uh, uh, I can go further. I don't have to, I promise I will actually remove these curls and all that now. And then the way to do that, again, is uh, if you write our electric field as, you know, a certain electric field amplitude times uh, uh, let's say it, it's certain direction, x direction, y direction, whichever, write it a unit vector along the n direction, times e to the power minus j k dot r. You know, that's how it's going to write. And if you see, uh, the, the way I'm writing it is now is only in real space because I've taken out the omega. I've applied my trick there. You know, j omega t taken all real. Right? If I take this, this is my electric field form, uh, uh, and, and uh, which solves Maxwell's equations, be it in material media or not in material media. But this is the form. And if I take, try to take a curl of this or a divergence of this, whichever way, if I take a curl of this, you see curl is, has, has all these, uh, you know, uh, del y's and all these, you know, cross terms and all that, right? Cur the curl, you know, it's trying to find how much the vector field is curling around a certain axis, for example. Uh, so, so, so uh, what it will do, and it, this is an, uh, you know, uh, something one can show that if you take a curl of this quantity, of e to the power this quantity, right, if you take a curl of, uh, in fact, if you take a curl of uh, anything that has e to the power j, k dot something, the curl can be completely re replaced by minus j, you know, whatever k is sitting here, uh, 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 cross. So, so you can replace the curl by this. And remember, this is not a vector. This is not a differential operator anymore. It's just a you know vector. Okay. Similarly, if you take a uh, divergence of any any vector field, you can replace it with minus j k dot. And if you take a gradient of any scalar field, scalar field which has no direction, but the gradient acts on a scalar field, converts it into a vector field, right? Tells you which direction is air flowing, if it's a cyclone or whatever, right? So, so uh, that then 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 uh, that then 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 that uh, would would actually uh, take you and give you j uh, uh, k. So so the, uh, it, it, there's no minus here; it just give you j k. So that's what I've kind of just summarized here. Uh, that uh, you can replace these operators if your electric if your vector field is doing. A waveform like this, e to the power j k r, k dot r. You can always, you know, just replace this. Obviously, as you see, if you have this plus another, if it's not monochromatic wave, I have k one, a certain wavelength, another wavelength. I have two modes. I can't do that anymore. Not one. But if you have monochromatic beam, just single frequency, single wavelength, no problem. This is fine. Right? So this is, this is the Fourier component in real space. Right? So, 
And as a result, what you get is a very nice uh, uh, relation. Uh, uh, you know, these curls, again, take curl of electric field, you get minus g omega, all that there. Uh, but uh, uh, this is very physical now because you said k curl of, you know, uh, il il so the k cross, k is the direction in which the wave is going, and k cross the electric field will give you plus omega mu naught times the magnetic field. K cross electric field it just replaces minus j, you know, k cross, right? And minus j and minus j cancel, it just got that. It's so simple. And similarly, k cross the magnetic field is going to give you, with a minus sign now, uh, omega uh, epsilon naught e, or displacement. So this is very visually, uh, appealing, I think. Uh, so, so this is k, uh, and if you have, I think uh, there's a reason they put it as k naught. k naught or k is basically the direction in which the electromagnetic wave is going. Let's say z, you know, the z axis. And the electromagnetic wave is moving in that direction. And the k is 2 pi over the wavelength times whichever direction it is moving in. z, x, y, whichever. Right? Yeah. And, and uh, what it's saying now is uh, uh, how do I find uh, the magnetic field direction and electric field direction for this particular wave? And uh, what it's saying is, well, k cross E is equal to magnetic field. So magnetic field is clearly perpendicular to k, right? It's cross uh, a product of two vectors is perpendicular. So, so you can have magnetic field maybe in this direction. And if you choose that, the electric field is perpendicular to magnetic field too. So I think you, you basically get clamped on all three. There's no, no choice left after that. So it tells you the direction of, uh, of the electric field, of the magnetic field, and E cross H. Uh, so uh, E, uh, I think the right-hand rule will tell you if you take E into H, you have a, your thumb is pointing along the K. So, so that you form a triad or the uh, three vector notation here. Yeah, uh, yeah, hopefully this is clear. I'm just doing a quick review of this part. And, 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 and obviously also you realize that the electric field is changing in real space, so, so it's oscillating as, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as, as a sine or a cosine. If you take the real part of it, sine or a cosine with, with in real space here, and so is the magnetic field, and, and they are perpendicular for this picture at least. They are perpendicular, they are in phase, and it, it goes to zero together, and then goes back and starts all over again, right, in the other direction, right? So, uh, not only that, from here you can do magnitudes on both sides and realize right away that the electric field magnitude or amplitude of electric field, maximum value of electric field by the maximum value of magnetic field will be given by square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. You can see from here. You just take the ratio, realize that omega is a frequency, 2 pi times frequency. Frequency is, is uh, speed of light by wavelength and all that sort of thing, right? So you can kind of make that conversion. So when, this is what you're going to get. Uh, I'm just not going to write that, but this is what you're we're getting. Uh, an easier way to kind of know the meaning of it is, is uh, and, and this has units, you'll realize right away, is, is eta naught, which is uh, in ohms of a resistor. And the value for free space is 377 ohms. That's the impedance of free space, right? impedance of free space. Physical meaning, if I think of electric field, you can kind of think I'm multiplying both top and bottom by a certain length, you know, dl, yeah, let's say, physically. An electric field times length is a voltage, right? Electric field times a certain length is a voltage. And a magnetic field times length, I think you know dl dot h is a current, right, from Salvador. Voltage or current, of course, it should be an impedance, right? So, so, so that, that, that's the physical meaning. Uh, uh, but, uh, but there are other many interpretations of it, which, which uh, I think you know we can talk. But I think at least, at least qualitatively, you can see this this sort of a connection here. Right? Right. So that's the impedance of free space, and then I think you can also see that the moment I have uh, uh, some some other material medium. I'll have my relative uh, dielectric constant or my square root of n here and all that sort of thing. So that gets changed, you know, the impedance changes in, in, in different materials. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so uh, uh, now, and then the final thing is uh, this picture of the electromagnetic wave going this way also gives you the intuition that the energy is being transported in that direction, right? And then the energy that flows per unit area, per unit time is half E cross 
H, but now we know that all these quantities are complex uh, because and in, in the end, if you want the real value, you have to take the real part of it. So E cross H, and that's the pointing vector. Right, uh, after the person who first uh, realized its importance. Uh, so S is that. And if you take the very simple, you know, plain polarized electromagnetic wave, what you will get is E squared by 2 eta naught times, you know, the direction in which the wave is moving. K hat is the direction. And that's what you're going to get. And again, you can think of it something like voltage square over resistance, V square by R, something like that. This is the power going per unit area per unit time. So, uh, sorry, so you, you, for a voltage, you should have a L squared here because that will be voltage, but this is per unit area, per unit, ta per unit time, per unit area too. So you're, this is the energy going across every one meter square of uh, solar. For example, if you, you have the sunlight hitting the earth and you kind of think all of it is at the same wavelength for simplicity, and you know you have like one watt per, uh, sorry, one kilowatt per meter square being incident, so you know this thing is one kilowatt per meter square. So from here, you know impedance of free space, you can find out electric field. It will be 1,000 volt per meter. So that's, so that's, that's the field for what are the numbers for this. Thing. Okay, so I, uh, I think we are uh, finally again uh, reaching the end of uh, the class. So uh, I want to kind of just say now that uh, uh, I never got to this point of uh, uncertainty, but uh, uh, so th this, is, this is a quick summary of uh, electromagnetic theory itself, uh, electric field, magnetic field, how does it behave particularly in a material media and the fact that if you have atoms to polarize, uh, which can have gain, uh, they act as a source term. And this is kind of the, probably the more important part, which uh, may not have been emphasized in earlier courses. Okay. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, discuss uh, the next topic from here on uh, in the next class then. Oh, before you forget, the next class is being taught by Professor Pollock and, uh, on, the, on this Friday. So it'll all be here, but it's by, taught by Pollock.